God bless you, everybody. Welcome to Worship in the Word with Life Center Church. I'm so glad you chose to join us on tonight. Come on, let's pray, and then we're going to jump into the Word. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy unto us. We thank you for this opportunity to come and to hear and to learn of you. We thank you for, Lord God, just loving us and just giving us an opportunity to be better by your Word. So, Father, tonight, let your Word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's make our declaration. I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what I hear. I'm moved by what I believe. And I believe the word of God. The victory is mine. I have it now. And I can see it through my eyes of faith. Grab your Bibles, grab your Bibles and go with me. We're going to continue down this road to different. And we talked about, uh, we talked about uh, what you, your vision. We talked about influence. Uh, and tonight we want to talk about influence. We talked about vision, but tonight we want to talk about measuring your influence. We talked about opportunity the first week. And we talked last week about uh, managing your vision. Because as you manage your life, as you go down this road to different, how you manage what God puts in front of you is going to matter. And so tonight, I want to talk about managing your influence, managing your influence. So uh, when I talk about managing your influence, uh, we must have the character to act with true conviction and to communicate true information. Because we all have influence. So with that influence, we have to have character. And with that influence, we have to create and we have to communicate the truth, really, of who God is. So, so what is influence? By definition, the word influence is the capacity or power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, behaviors, opinions of others. All right? The capacity or power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, behaviors, and opinions of others. All of us have that capacity. Everyone has influence. Everyone has the ability to be a compelling, a compelling force on the behavior or the opinions of others. Even a newborn babe has influence. What do you mean? Because when that baby, it can be one day, one month, years old, if it begins to cry, it causes an effect that causes that parent or that caretaker to try to find out what's going on. Everyone has influence. So if you think about it, who, who do you influence? You're in the middle. You influence your children, your family. You have influence on friends, fellow students that you go to school, co-workers, neighbors, spouses, children, even your enemies. You have influence and you have the capacity to affect them. So let's grab our Bibles. What does the Bible say about the influence that we have? Matthew chapter number five, Matthew chapter number five, verse number 13. Matthew 5, 13 says this, says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing but to, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? All right. You are the salt of the earth. Salt is intended to change anything it comes in contact with. Salt is known as a preservative. In anything salt touches, you can never put salt in anything and not know it's there. You can never add salt, even if it's a pinch of salt. You know because salt influences whatever it touches. And every one of us are influential in, our ver in very different ways. The question is, how do we use and manage our influence? Because how we use and manage our influence can spell the difference between success and or failure for us and those whose lives we affect. Those whose lives we have an impact on, the lives we touch, how we manage that influence 
will be success or failure for the lives that we touch. The stewardship of influence, the management of influence, in reality, if we, we, it is the management of relationships. For us as human beings, the stewardship or the management of influence is the management of relationships. So let's look at the text. The text says that it, it, it talks about salt and savor or salt and flavor, salt and savor. Salt, when you look at the word in the, in the Bible, that word salt is, is translated halas, which means prudence or uh, and you, when you talk about prudence, you, you are measured, all right? Being decisive or being, being um, deci not decisive, but being discerning, all right? So salt, uh, the caution with regard to practical matters, having discretion, care and management of resources, that word salt in the, in the Greek, it's, it's, it's translated as prudence, being cautious in practical master, having discretion. You are the salt. You are the influence, but you have, to, you have to have discretion in what you do and how you do. But if the salt loses its prudence, if it loses its savor, if it becomes the term is insipid, I-N-S-I-P-I-D, insipid. If it becomes insipid, it is without distinction. It has no more stimulating qualities without taste to be pleasing. It becomes bland. It loses its savor. So you are the salt. You are the Caution, the regard, the practicality. You are the discretion that God has put in the earth. But if that influence that you have has lost, it's become insipid, has become less stimulating, has become less interesting. Once that happens and it loses its savor, once it, be it ceases to impact what it touches, it's no good. It's no good. When it ceases to change what it comes in contact with, it's no good. And it's only good to be thrown on the ground and trampled on. In other words, it's, it's useless. A disciple whose influence does not change what he touches, what she touches, is useless. You ought to affect the environment, watch this, in a positive way. So how do I do that? What makes me as a disciple, what makes me effective? What makes me uh, able to impact? I told you it's, it's about relationship. What makes me impactful is my ability to be relevant to where I am. You cannot influence anyone that you cannot relate to. If you are unrelatable, you cannot be influential. How, how am I unrelatable? You can be unrelatable because you are not uh, in tune with where that individual is, or you may not be as aware. Or you can be unrelatable because you're overbearing. Do you know, have you ever had food that had too much salt? Couldn't eat it, because it was too salty. Some of you are so overtly religious that you are, the taste that you leave in people's mouth is a turnoff. Look at Acts chapter number 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. The Bible says, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named what? Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. 
He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was what? A Greek. Had nothing to do with Timothy. Everybody liked Timothy. Paul says, if you're going to go on the road with me, if you're going to witness with me in this region, this region, I need you to be relatable. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So why does Paul circumcise Timothy? Because Timothy was in sin? No. Because Timothy was wrong? No. Because Timothy was offensive? No. The Bible says they liked Timothy. But he says, for the ministry that we have to do, you have to become more relatable. You have to become, when they see you, they have to see you as one of them. They have to see you as one of them. And see, sometimes because in the church, you're like, well, we'll come out from among them and be separate. You can't be like them. You can't. That is taking it completely out of time. That has nothing to do with you being relatable. That has to do with you not participating in the sinful acts that they perform, in the sinful things that they do. But you have to be relatable. You have to be able to, sometimes disciples don't, they underestimate the ability to fit in. The ability not to be offensive. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. Here's Paul. Now remember, he, he has circumcised Timothy. And as he has circumcised Timothy, and Paul now explains again, he's explaining again why he is a chameleon. He's explaining again in 1 Corinthians 9 why he is so transitory in his, and why he, he causes Timothy to be the same. Watch this, verse number 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more. Now, if you go up and you look at the beginning of the chapter, he has already declared that whether he eats meat or doesn't eat meat, he's free from the condemnation whether he eats meat or doesn't eat meat. As he comes down into verse 19, he, and he begins to talk about he is free from them financially because he's a tent maker. He has his own, his own business. He's talking about being free from, from them financially. So what he is saying is, I don't uh, have to please anybody. He says, though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more. He says, I don't have to, but I've made myself. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. For those who are without the law, as without the law, watch this, not being without law towards God, but under the law towards Christ. In other words, to those who were not believers, to those who were not under the law, who are without the law, I became as them without offending God. There is a way to come into the presence of unbelievers and not offend God, but you don't have to offend them. He says, I became like those without the law, not being without law towards God. I didn't offend God. I didn't let down my principles that I might win those who are what? Without the law. Everything he did to be transitory was for one end, to make, to make disciples. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, watch this, that I might by all means save some. You're never going to reach everybody, but I'm going to, in every circumstance, be all that I can be to be influential in the circumstances that I'm in. Because my job is to win some. 
Why is it so important to manage your influence? Because if you don't manage your influence, you cannot fulfill the Great Commission. If you don't manage your influence, you cannot fulfill what God has really called us to do. If you do not, he says, now this I do for the what? Gospel's sake. I might be a partaker of it with you so I can win some. Augustine said this. He said, man is most free when controlled by God alone. What does that mean? It means there, there was a saying years ago uh, that people, young people say, you know, and, and you see it now even on social media when uh, only God can judge me. But they use it in a negative sense. Only God can judge me. In other words, they're telling you, you can't have an opinion. Well, everybody can, anybody can have an opinion on anything that you do. But what, it, what, what, what Paul, what Augustine is saying, he's saying, I am accountable to God. It's not a statement of freedom to, to behave. It's a statement of freedom to influence. It is not a statement of freedom to act any kind of way you want. Only God can judge me. It is a statement of influence. God is the ultimate judge of what I do. Because don't you think when Paul became what he needed to become to, to please the Jews that the Gentiles didn't like it? Don't you think when Paul became what he needed to become to, please, to, to reach the Gentiles that the Jews didn't like it? Don't you think when Paul became what he needed to to win those with the law that those without the law didn't like it? Don't you think when God, when Paul became what he needed to win the weak that the, that the strong didn't like it? To win those without the law that those with the law didn't like it? He says, if I worry about people liking what I do, if I worry about people liking how I approach, he says, if I worry about that, he says, but only God. He says, I am controlled by God alone. I'm just worried, is God pleased with me? Is God pleased with what I'm doing with my influence? Is God pleased with how I'm impacting the world? It is not a statement of freedom It's a, but to, of, to behave, but a freedom to have influence. What do you mean, freedom to have influence? In other words, I'm going to influence in the world that God puts around me, and I'm not going to take into account what the church is going to think about me, what, what, what religious folk are going to think about me. What be, I'm not taking that into account. The question is, am I offending God? And if I know I'm not offending God, then I'm going to do what God has shared and has, has me to do in order to reach who God wants me to reach. The Great Commission is an assignment to influence. The Great Commission is an assignment to properly utilize your influence. Matthew 28, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and watch this. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Great Commission. Go make disciples. Go make disciples. Taking that four words, go and make disciples, many of us see that as go and get people to convert. Go get people to get saved. Go get people to be saved. Go get people to give their life to Jesus. Go get people. That's just half of it. Make disciples, but look at verse number 20. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded. It's one thing to evangelize. It's another thing to disciple. Evangelism is leading someone to faith in Christ. Discipleship is leading someone to follow Christ wholeheartedly. It's leading someone to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. 
Not just getting someone to say, okay, I believe, but that did they commit? Evangelism is good, but discipleship is better. Believing is good, but following after Christ is better. When I believe, when I am a disciple, there's going to be a sign, there's going to be signs that follow me. When I believe, when I am a disciple, there's going to be signs that follow me. Look at Mark chapter number 16. Chapter number 16, verse number 9. Look at this. Now, when he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he was, had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every culture. It is a restatement of the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. What was the Great Commission? Go and make disciples. Go into the world and make disciples of all nations. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Here's the bottom line. Believers produce evidence. Believers produce evidence that they are believers. When I am just evangelistic and concentrate on conversion and I don't teach them, I am not instilling in them the proper ways to be evident. Believers produce evidence. So here's the question. Are you using your influence to make disciples? That's the question. Are you using your influence to make disciples? Take a minute. I want you to take a minute right now and think. How many people can you think of that are disciples today because of your soul? Not how many people have you led to conversion. How many people can you think of today that are wholeheartedly serving God because you were your influence was salty? You, you had just the right amount of salt to influence them to wholeheartedly follow Christ. How many people? Because Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, its savor, how shall it be seasoned again? How should it be seasoned? How, how can anything be seasoned if there's no flavor, savor in the salt? It's good for nothing. It's good for nothing. The proof of your discipleship is disciples. The proof of your discipleship is disciples. Woo! You cannot claim to be a disciple if you are not creating disciples. You are the salt of the earth. Where, how's your list going? How's your list going? How many people can you think of that are disciples wholeheartedly serving God today because of your savor?
your flavor, your saltiness. The proof of your discipleship is disciples. How do I know that? Because Paul, they're questioning his authority as an apostle. Is Second Corinthians chapter number three, and I'm going to read this in the New International Version because it's it's it, it's just so clear. Are we beginning to commend ourselves? Second Corinthians three one. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? In other words, are we having to prove ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you from, or from you? Do we, do we need somebody to, to say who we are? Do we need somebody to validate who we are? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. Paul says, listen, I don't need a letter of recommendation. The fact that your disciples is my letter of recommendation. The fact that you're believing, you, the fact of where you are, you're my letter. You show, verse 3, that you are a letter for Christ. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on the tables of human hearts. Paul says, what are my credentials? My credentials are, look, these disciples. You're my letter. He says, I don't need, I don't need a letter confirming who I am. I, you're my, you're the proof of my apostleship. You're the proof. I wonder if you could look around and, and look and say, say to somebody, that's the proof of my discipleship because my influence is written on their heart. That, that's the proof of my discipleship. Listen, each and every one of you is influential in very definitive and definable ways. And how you use and manage that influence can spell the difference between success and failure in making disciples of those we affect. Period. What are you doing with your influence? How are you managing your influence? Can you, like Paul, say, here's my evidence? If not, there's something wrong. If not, are you truly a disciple? Because discipleship, disciples make disciples. Evangelism is good. Discipleship is better. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for, Father, this is almost a wake-up call to all of us. As we are living in the last days. And Lord, you are calling us to get back to the basics. You're calling us to not just be hearers, but Father, to be out in the world influencing and, and casting and passing the salt, the safe flavor, the gospel to who you are and influencing people to wholeheartedly follow you. Not just to say, I believe. Not just to say, okay, not just to say, I'll come to church with you, but Father, having an impact that creates disciples. And so, Father, I pray today that you allow us, Father, who have not been about your business to forgive us. Forgive us, Father, for not using our influence properly. And Father, today, as we have been awakened again, to why you really called us. Help us to help us to impact, to influence those areas and spaces that you put us in. And we thank you for the disciples that you're going to use us to create. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining me here. Listen, maybe today you're watching and you're not a disciple and you say, man, I, I, I really 
heard what you're saying. You have influence too. You want to become a disciple? I want you to call that number on the bottom of your screen and somebody will be waiting to pray with you and to lead you to Christ and to share with you and to teach you the things so that you can wholeheartedly follow Christ. God bless you. We appreciate you for joining us. Come back on next week. Come back on next week. And uh, we're going to, again, be talking about uh, how to manage the things that God puts in our lives. I want to talk next week about how to manage your commitments. Sometimes we commit in the church. We commit to things. We commit to work. We commit to things. And we, even in our lives, we make promises to people. The Bible says that your yay be yay and your nay be nay. So I want to talk about managing your commitment on next week. So meet me back here next week at seven o'clock at seven o'clock as we talk about managing your commitments. It's offering time. It's offering time. And so I want you to take advantage of one of the avenues that are on the screen and, and give, give, uh, and let God speak to you and give as you, as you, God, uh, places it on your heart. God bless you. I love you. I appreciate you. We will see you meet us on Sunday, Sunday at 1030. Don't walk through the door alone. Influence somebody to come and begin their walk of discipleship. We'll see you on Sunday and then we'll see you back here on Tuesday night. God bless you, brothers and sisters. We love you and we'll see you soon.